Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Saja. Um, welcome to today's CREATES webinar on integrating older adults into today's work environment. Um, I'm going to be sharing this webinar with my colleague, uh, Neil Charness. Uh, I'm a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Miller School of Medicine. I also direct our Center on Aging and our CREATE Center. CREATE stands for the Center for Research and Education on Aging and Technology Enhancement. And we've been funded by the National Institutes on Aging since 1999. We're very fortunate to be together for that long and have NIA support. Uh, CREATE is a multi-site center. It involves the University of Miami, Florida State University, Georgia Institute of Technology, and also the University of Illinois. Our focus is on aging older adults and their interactions with technology systems in home domains, in service domains, at, in healthcare domains, and also in the workplace, which is going to be the focus of our webinar today. So what we're going to talk about today um, we're going to provide a brief overview of what's happening in today's employment landscape with respect to demographics, uh, specifically focusing on age. We'll talk a little bit about what changes are occurring in the work environment and the important role technology is paying, playing with respect to those changes. Uh, talk about and hopefully dispel current existing myths about older workers and workplace performance talk about aging and issues in technology adoption. We'll review some characteristics of the aging process and older workers that are particularly relevant to employment and job design. And then talk uh, a bit about skill acquisitions, design of training programs, and work environments to accommodate older adults. We'll begin with by talking about the employment landscape uh, in terms of demographics. One trend we're noticing, and it's a big trend, is and it contributes talked a lot about uh, in the news right now, is the increase in number of older adults who qualify for publicly financed retirement and health benefits. At the same time, there are a decrease in the number of younger workers who work and pay taxes. There are also changes to address these two issues that I just mentioned. There are changes in government and organizational pension policies that favor extending working life to try and offset some of the problems with a large number of people um, getting retirement benefits. Many industries are also looking to older people to come back to work or remain in the labor force to address problems of skill shortages. And finally, we know that many middle-aged and older workers are choosing to work longer or even go back to work either at a full-time, a part-time basis, or perhaps an, an entirely different job for financial reasons, health benefits, or because they want to continue working. In fact, AARP did a survey not too long ago, a fairly large survey, the number of per, uh, people who participated was 1,500 middle-aged and older adults, and they, one of the questions on the survey was why they wanted to go back or to continue to work. And we can see that many of them, in fact, were financial. They need the money. They need to maintain health insurance costs or to save for retirement. But we can also see equally important were non-financial reasons. They liked working. They enjoyed their job. Uh, they liked, they, work made them feel productive and useful. So you can see it's a mix of reasons why people want to continue to work. If, in fact, if we look at some data in terms of labor force participation rates uh, by age, if we project out to um, 2022, which is the blue line on this graph, we can see not only an increase in the number of workers age 65 to 74, 
four, but also workers age 75 and over. This is a very different trend that we have seen in prior years, especially in the 70s and 80s when people were choosing to retire early. This picture is changing. So what are some workplace trends that are happening at the same time that we see an aging of the workforce? One is there's an increased emphasis on knowledge and skilled work. There's also an increased emphasis on teamwork and team performance where people are expected to collaborate together to perform a job. Many workers are working in non-standard work arrangements. They're engaging, for example, in telework from home. Another big trend is that training is shifting to workers. The responsibility for learning needed job skills, for example, learning new computer applications or learning how to operate a particular type of technology. Gaining those skills um, is now becoming the responsibility of workers, of those looking for work. Clearly, there's a rapid and continual diffusion of technology into work environments. And this is really changing how work is performed, where people are working, and importantly, how work is conducted. We also rely a lot now on technology for communication activities. That not only broadens the number of people, potential people we can communicate with, but also increases work demands um, you're never away from your email. You're expected to send information in a much faster fashion and make decisions more rapidly than ever before. And finally, there's a increased reliance on technology-based worker training. This whole concept and uh, domain of e-learning, and this is supposed to help address some of the challenges associated with the responsibility of training shifting to workers. So if we think about technology in the workplace, what are some of the potential for older workers? Well, certainly there are some negative implications. Technology by its nature places a greater emphasis on cognitive abilities. Why this is challenging for older workers is, as Neil will uh, talk about a little later, uh, there are age-related changes in cognition, which may make these demands on cognitive abilities more challenging or difficult for older people. Continual changes in technology uh, imply that people constantly have to learn new skills and interact with new systems, which means current job skills and knowledge be rapidly become obsolete or need to be updated. And usability problems create barriers for everyone, but particularly for older adults. Okay. Now at the same time there are positive implications, there are also some uh, negative implications, there are also some positive implications. While technology places a greater emphasis on cognitive abilities, it also reduces the physical demands of work, which is very good for older people. Um, it provides opportunity for older adults to remain productive. They can work at home or uh, buy a telework or have more flexible work arrangements. Adaptive technologies may, may work more viable for older people who have chronic condition or some kind of a disability. And although we don't have a solid evidence base, there is some data to suggest that multimedia systems uh, used in the context of training, this is where you can combine graphics and text and speech, may be particularly effective for older adults because of age-related declines in sensory and perceptual processes. So the critical questions when we put this all together, the changes in workplaces, the influx of technology, and the aging of the workforce it are Will older people be able to successfully access as well as adapt to these new technologies and job requirements? Will they have the requisite skills for today's jobs and technologies? Will they have access to training, retraining, and job opportunities? 
And will they be able to adapt to the changing characteristics of work, such as teamwork and telework? These are some of the issues we've been grappling with in CREATE. So what do we know about aging and work? Well, certainly there are a lot of myths, and unfortunately these myths uh, still exist today. That older people are technophobic, they're not interested in learning, they're not able to learn, they're unreliable and absent more than younger workers, they also perform at lower levels than younger workers, and they have higher rates of job turnover. So what's the reality? One, <laughs> our data over the years, as well as that of other people, has certainly shown that older people are receptive to using new technologies. We just finished a study where we had 98-year-old people who had never used a computer before sending emails and using the internet. They may be less comfortable though and have less self-efficacy about their ability to learn to use technology than younger adults, but we do know that they can learn new skills, and I can't stress that enough, and experience gains in function. We also know, based on some meta-analysis that have been that have been performed, that overall there's not a relationship between job productivity and worker age. It really depends on the type of task and the performance metric. Um, at the same time, absenteeism is inversely related to age. In other words, older people are less likely to be absent than younger people. If we think about workplace injuries, they happen usually to workers when they're just beginning their job and have less skills and experience. Uh, job change rates uh, are lower for older than younger workers, especially in today's environments where younger people switch jobs, switch organizations quite frequently. Uh, the little work that's been done on aging and teamwork, and this is, uh, this is not an area that's been researched to a great extent, show that in fact that older adults are effective members of teams. They like to leverage their expertise and they like to promote collaboration among team members. They also serve as good mentors to younger workers. And in fact, if we think about productivity, it's obsolescence, not having the requisite skills that's a greater threat to productivity than age. And unfortunately, older workers are often overlooked for training or retraining opportunities because of some of the myths that I talked to you about earlier. I'll just show you some data from a study that we did not too long ago. This was a focus group study and our focus was on um, older workers from lower socioeconomic status who were interested in returning to work. We wanted to find out what kind of barriers were they confronting and also get some information on their training needs and preferences, how they would prefer to be trained to learn job skills. We use both questionnaires as well as focus group methodology and because the primary data collection mechanism was focus groups, our sample was 37 adults ranging in age from 50 to 75 years of age. Uh, these were folks who wanted to go back into the workforce and they um, were ethnically diverse, okay? which is not surprising given that we did this study in South Florida. So if we look at their reasons for wanting to return to work, it's interesting that they pretty much parallel what we saw earlier with the AARP study. A major factor, of course, major factors were financial. They needed the money, they needed uh, to save for retirement, or they needed benefits. But equally as important okay, were other reasons that were non-financial. Work made them feel useful, they liked being productive, it felt that they were helping others, and a large percentage, 60%, feel that people should work if they can't. They have an obligation to make productive contributions to society. However, if we look at some of the reasons they were confident 
or the, some of the barriers about them successfully finding a job. A big one was age. Okay, People felt that they would not be hired or desired by employers because they were older. Interestingly, uh, apropos my earlier comments, um, where we said that people had to be given opportunities for training and for work, uh, one thing that came up time and time again was that they had didn't have the correct computer skills to compete in today's labor market. And tied to that, as well as the age um, problem, was that they would have limited employment opportunities. So now I'm going to turn it over to Neil, who's going to talk about the characteristics of older adults relative to work activities. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so I want to start with just a couple of caveats about drawing generalizations about older workers. First, it's that aging is, in fact, a continuous, dynamic, very much a multidimensional process. It's characterized by a high degree of variability. Older people are more unlike each other than our younger people. The good news is that it's also associated with plasticity. As Sarah's already alluded to, and I'll bring up again, older adults can learn. The good news is that today's and tomorrow's older adults are much better educated, they're more diverse, they're healthier on average, and more active than previous generations. And many want to remain active and productively engaged, as Sarah discussed with that uh, uh, focus group study. The other thing to keep in mind, and, and Sarah's already alluded to that, in terms of the relationship between age and productivity, is that chronological age by itself is often a very poor predictor of work performance. So with that, let me start with some more good news. First good news is if you look at the trends from the 1960s to close to the current day, we have a much more educated labor force. Um, the number of people, the percentage of the uh, workforce population that has a high school graduation or greater has gone from a little over 20% to more like 80% today. Bachelor's degrees have gone up from maybe 3 or 4% to approaching 20%. The diversity in our labor force is expected to continue to develop. So by 2060, the non-Hispanic white population uh, over the age of 65 is expected to shrink, but it's going to go up in almost every other segment, as you can see, in some cases tripling uh, from the proportions that we see today. So we're going to have a very diverse labor force. The other interesting trend to kind of take note about is the very rapid diffusion of technology, which seems over time to be accelerating. If we look at some landmark inventions, like the fax machine, by Alexander Bain in 1843. It took about 150 years before the fax machine was widespread, okay, roughly, I think as a benchmark, 50% adoption in the US. Uh, if we look at the telephone invented about 33 years later by Alexander Bell, um, it took about 44 years before there was roughly 50% adoption in US households look at the microprocessor invented by Intel in 1971, it took only 30 years before microprocessors were in half of U.S. households. And the internet spread even more quickly, uh, TCPIP invented in 1983, it was a mere 18 years. And then who knows about the technologies in 2017 yet to come, we have a few months left, how long it's going to take for them, but you can see the trend is very clear. 144, 30, 18, the pace is definitely increasing. Nonetheless, older adults still lag in adoption of a variety of technologies. And I'll give you just a few examples from U.S. data uh, from the Pew Internet and American Life Project. If we look at Internet use, whereas there's been, it's almost 100% uh, for the youngest cohorts in our sample, 18 to 29, 30 to 49. A little bit of lag. It's still not at uh, uh, even 90% yet for those uh, 50 to 64. 
But there's been a, what appears to be a huge increase in the extent to which the 65 population is now using the internet. Went from about 15% uh, to about 65% in 2016. Now, a lot of that represents aging of that cohort. Those people who are 50 to 64 in the year 2000 are now well ensconced in 2016 in the 65 population. Nonetheless, it's pretty clear there's a, both an increase but also a lag. The same is true if we look at smartphones. Even though telephony, telephone technology, as I pointed out earlier, increased rapidly in the U.S. population so that half the households had it at about the time that the current older cohorts were young adults, you can see there's still a lag. If you compare the number of people with smartphones, that is the blue lines, 92%, 88%, 74% for those 50 to 64, it's still only about 43%, 42% for those 65 plus. So, why this lag in technology adoption? Well, Create has been investigating this over the years. We can pinpoint a number of important factors. One of them is relatively poor design. A second is poor training. We don't often have good training packages to get people up and running. If you buy a new smartphone, uh, what sort of training manual comes in the box? Probably none. Um, maybe a get started, very, very brief training manual. The other interesting barrier is less access to support. Um, although there are often 1 800 numbers for a lot of technology products, it's usually not that easy to get hold of people on the end of the line, and sometimes their accents are a barrier to. Uh, understanding their uh, attempts to help you. Generally, if you look at models of technology adoption, they, evaluate, they basically rotate along, such as the TAM model, for instance, around perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. Whereas a lot of older adults do see some perceived usefulness in products, particularly the workers, perceived ease of use is often low. And that leads to potentially negative attitudes towards using, which in turn affect behavioral intention, which in turn affects actual use. Now, there are other uh, more sophisticated models out there. I just want to point to them. I'm not going to go into them in any detail, like the universal theory of adoption and use of technology and the senior technology adoption models. But at the heart of all of them are things like performance expectancy, effort expectancy, which is perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use. And similarly, in the STAM model, perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use, all play, play an extremely important role. Okay, so I'm going to switch over now to just looking at why perceived ease of use might be changing in older worker populations. And there are a number of normative changes in vision that we need to pay attention to. Uh, I'll just point out some of the basic changes. One of them is pupillary meiosis inability to open wide the pupil to admit light into the eye. Another is increased scattering of light transmitted to the fovea through the lens, the cornea of the lens and the vitreous humor system to the fovea area. Um, the other big change, and one which most people perceive by their mid-40s, is what is known as presbyopia, loss of ability to focus on near objects. Rapid shifts between near and far vision can be problematic as a result. A lot of uh, those of us in our 40s or later will note that um, unless we get reading glasses, sometimes it's very hard to make out details. And even if you're wearing bifocals in your, for instance, in your car and looking at the instrument panel, it may fall between the two lenses, making it hard to read. The main thing to consider, though, is that roughly a third of the light reaches the retina for 65-year-olds compared to 20-year-olds when you're considering low light conditions. And as well, both the cornea and the lens thicken. That's what leads to presbyopia, inability to change focus. But also there's yellowing and opacities, that is, uh, things like cataracts developing in the visual system. So what does it mean? First of all, it means that things like dark adaptation um, the level of adaptation decreases, and the absolute maximum that you can reach decreases. The rate is generally unaffected by age. 
That's due to things like, as I mentioned, pupillary meiosis, lens growth, photoreceptor sensitivity is also affected. And where that makes a difference is when people have to move between very bright and very dark environments, for instance, pulling into a uh, parking lot, covered parking lot as an example. It may make it hard to leave and enter the parking garage safely. Glare recovery. Older, elderly adults tend to be much more sensitive to glare. And so glare recovery time increases pretty well from the age of the 20s. And then in terms of color perception, it's much more difficult to perceive colors in the violet, indigo, blue part of the spectrum. Another important change with age is in the useful field of vision. So typically our sharpest vision is in roughly one to two degrees that the fovea provides. You also have access to parafoveal vision, which gives you information out perhaps to 10 degrees around the fixation point. And it varies depending on things like stimulus characteristics, background noise, competing demands on your, your skill level. But in general, the peripheral field, your ability to perceive from looking straight ahead out from 180 degrees where things might just enter the visual field, like if you're driving, concentrating straight ahead and someone steps off the curb into your lane, that diminishes from 180 to 140 degrees by age 70. There's greater loss for short wavelength targets, as I've mentioned before. Um, and there's also physical and neural mechanisms that are changing that um, essentially affect that type of loss. Where that may become important, say you're using digital gaming to try to improve cognition and perception. You'll have to pay attention to where you place things because items in the periphery will be harder to perceive. I'll shift next to hearing. There is major hearing loss that takes place, particularly as you enter the 50s, as I'm going to show in a minute. Uh, why, in particular, if you look in the hearing apparatus into the cochlea, there's loss of the hair cells that are responsible for transducing physical movement to neural firing as information leaves the cochlea via the cochlear nerve. And that affects about 30% of people from people between the ages of 60 to 75 50% of people have significant hearing loss by the age of 75 to 79. In fact, it's second only to arthritis, of which about 50% of people by age 75 will likely have arthritis as a problem um, as people age and age in workplaces. A lot of practical consequences. One is failure to understand speech, in, particularly in noisy environments. Another problem is difficulty hearing things like a phone ringing or a doorbell. Uh, problems enjoying entertainment, for instance, in movies, when there's speech and they superimpose music on top of it. But more critically, um, failing to hear a low battery alert, uh, telling you to recharge your cell phone, as an example. And hearing loss generally can lead to fear of social engagement, because you're having to ask people to repeat themselves, can lead to depression, and particularly social withdrawal. Now, the good news is many types of hearing loss are treatable, uh, particularly with hearing aids. What's the extent of hearing loss? If we look at just the threshold for hearing, and these are old figures taken from a chapter in uh, the first book I was associated with in the field of aging, aging and human performance. And what you can see here are plots asking, how loud does a sound have to just be for it to just be made out? So it's the threshold. How soft is the sound? You can see it's about 10 dB for most hearing frequencies. But by the time you get to 80, you can see that even for the sweet spot in hearing, that is the 1,000 to 250 to 1,000 hertz sounds, that is low frequency sounds, it's dropped significantly. It has to be almost 40 decibels for males to just be able to detect it. If you're talking about an 8,000 hertz tone, it has to be at just about jet engine loudness, 100 dB, before it'll just be perceptible. And of course, there are differences between males and females. Males are far more likely to have hearing loss than, than uh, females. Just to give you a little bit of a simulation of the nature of that change, uh, we'll see how it plays out here. Here's an example of listening to an organ 
by an 80-year-old. You can perhaps just barely make out that sound. In comparison, this is what that same organ music would sound like to someone with normal hearing at age 20. So you can see, if it's uncorrected, hearing loss can be a barrier for older individuals. And this is reflected as well in things like speech comprehension. If we look across the lifespan, you can see that although you're most sensitive in your 20s, even though your uh, hearing function, that is your uh, threshold is, is better, in fact, at age six to nine, but your familiarity with language is less, sweet spot's about 20 to 29, and then things tend, tend to drop off precipitously in your 50s and out towards your 80s. And that gets even worse. What I've shown you are some data we collected in CREATE, looking at people's ability to understand synthetic speech, uh, which you'll often hear on recordings when you dial in for um, help on helplines. So if you look at your ability to perceive just single words in isolation that involve synthetic speech, number one, it's very poor relative to actual speech, even in your young adult years, but it falls off far more precipitously as you get to older adulthood. So let me try to summarize. One useful heuristic you can employ for trying to understand all these types of perceptual and even motor process changes with age is to consider that an older adult's system is basically like a noisy information channel. That is, for any strength of external signal, whether it's an organ playing or someone talking to you, the system's output, an older adult's system's output that is, their signal-to-noise ratio is lower in older systems than in younger adult systems. So how do you counteract that? You do it by trying to boost signal strength. That could be something as simple, if we're talking about visual objects, as increasing the size of the visual objects, using a greater font size, using a larger icon size, increasing the brightness of that information, say on a screen increasing or improving the contrast of that information. Particularly for auditory signals, try to keep them in the sweet spot of around 1,000 hertz and minimize accompanying noise. It really pays to have quieter workplaces if you're going to have conversations that older adults can easily uh, perceive and, and work with. I'm now going to switch across to issues around skill acquisition and learning. Because as Sarah said, a lot of the major changes we observe are in the cognitive system. So let me just present you with something of a framework to think about the factors that are important that you'll want to uh, pay attention to when you design training packages and training programs for older workers. The first is you have to look at both the person, their cognitive abilities like their knowledge, their working memory, speed of processing. How motivated are they to engage in learning? That's going to be a function of things like personality, their degree of self-efficacy, the discount rate for new knowledge, their attitudes towards learning. And then you have to pay particular attention to the training environment, things like how you pace the, uh, the lessons that you provide, um, whether there's testing, what type of feedback you use, the density of the information that you're presenting, the format that you're presenting in it and in particular, spacing when you're repeating information and hoping someone will learn. So let me just try to summarize a lot of work on cognition with some meta-analyses, cases where people, in this case, uh, Paul Verhechen at uh, Georgia Tech, um, provided estimates for the nature of the changes. And this is really using something like a correlation coefficient. And what you can see is that things change for the worse. In general, speed of processing, the rate of information processing goes down fairly substantially, negative 0.5 with age. Working memory, that decreases as well, again, fairly strongly, negatively with age. And episodic memory, your ability to remember new information that's presented to you for a short period of time, and then you have to recall it immediately, that also tends to show declines. 
And generally speaking, these all represent medium to large effects of age. Now, that's the bad news. Here's the good news. Here's some data we collected from large samples in CREATE across our different sites, over a thousand people, looking at other aspects that are really important in learning. One of them is your general knowledge about the world. And what you can see is that, although it isn't a strong effect, in general it tends to go up with age. That is, the straight line increases from 20 through to 80. In fact, the very top level people in terms of performance, some of them were in their uh, late 60s, 70s, and even 80s. And the same is true if you look at another measure of knowledge, often called crystallized intelligence. Vocabulary also tends to go up strikingly with age. So what you end up with is what we'll call the knowledge processing ability trade-off. There are two very different trends for what we call crystallized and fluid abilities. In general, as I just showed you, crystallized abilities tend to increase into early adulthood and then stabilize and then perhaps decline slightly in later, later in life. Fluid abilities, as I pointed out earlier with those meta-analyses by Walter Eichen, fluid abilities tend to decline pretty well from the 20s. And so someone's performance over time tends to represent a balance between those two sets of abilities. And here is sort of a graph that Simonton, who's looked at peak performance and age, uh, has assembled looking at peak performance of everybody from physicists to psychologists to chess players to um, people who make uh, basically politicians who run our country. And what they typically show is that your peak age is somewhere in your 30s to 40s, chronological age, as opposed to career age. And then there's a relatively slow but steady decline thereafter. But it depends a lot. In some domains, you're as good in your 60s as you were in your 20s. And that's probably why, because of this curvilinear relationship, there's very little relationship between age and work performance. But a good way to demonstrate this particular trade-off is with a study that uh, was run in my lab some years ago when Microsoft released their very first Word for Windows word processor. And we looked at two different groups, either complete novices who were first learning the word processor and people who had already had experience. So these are the novices shown in the um, light-colored uh, bars and then the experienced individuals in the dark bars. And you can see that for novices, you get the expected effects for cognition. That is, older adults, um, these were people in their kind of mean age of 70, of uh, 56, of 25. Um, there was a strict linear increase in the time it took people to complete word tutorials. And these were self-paced tutorials. People could go at the pace they thought they needed to be able to learn the new information. This was over a, roughly a week period. But you'll see that for people who had already learned a word processor, learning the new word processor, there was barely any change between young and middle-aged adults. And in fact, older adults who had already learned one word processor were performing in, in terms of their speed of acquisition of new information about the same. In fact, this wasn't a statistically significant difference between young adults who had never learned a word processor. So knowledge makes a huge difference. And that's why when you train, you want to draw on the knowledge and experience of older workers in your environment. But one of the barriers to learning is willingness to train. And some of the very earliest work in our field by the Belbins in the 1970s in the UK showed that older workers were far more reluctant than younger ones to apply for and accept training. And that's consistent with motivational shifts that we see in terms of work motivation that other people have demonstrated in general for the work population. So the implication is when you are about to engage in a new training program, you want to stress the benefits of training, assure that the rewards are available, so the, the perceived utility of training remains high 
for older workers. Now, as Sarah pointed out already, because of the myths around older workers, management is often not willing to offer training to older workers for fear that they're not going to recover their training costs because the older workers are older, they might retire sooner. However, um, some of the fears are well-founded. There was a meta-analysis on worker training showing a disadvantage in performance for older compared to younger workers. And there has been other meta-analyses showing that age was a significant negative predictor of the employer's chance of advancement or their hiring, or in fact, their performance appraisal. But there was a nice study by Libby Brook, who was a colleague of mine in a study on workforce aging in the new economy, looking at the IT industry, that showed that, in fact, Older worker training is quite economically justified. Why? Because older workers are far more likely to remain with a firm after training. And so you will get benefit by training older workers. They're far more likely to stay in their employment setting than a younger worker who shifts far more frequently. Okay, so let me try to summarize a large mass of literature on how you would organize training for older adults, and particularly for older workers. One of them is, and this is something that we found over and over again in CREATE when we've done studies looking at stress levels. When people first move into the laboratory, we have physiological measures of stress, like blood pressure readings, for instance. You need to give older adults time to settle in, particularly at the very first session of training. Another is you want to train on realistic problems. If you can, for reasons that I just showed you, try to build on existing knowledge. It makes the training meaningful, and they're going to gain more if they can link new information to existing knowledge. And they have a lot of existing knowledge. The other is to emphasize the long-term gains. And minimize the learning costs when you train. You want to prefer self-paced training, if that's at all possible. You want to prefer what we call part task training. Train the task, if it's a complex task, break it up into its parts. Train each part well before you try to put them all together. And I'll get back to this point in a minute. The other thing is to prefer what we call spaced mass practice. If you're going to be giving people opportunities to acquire a skill, then you want to space out the practice. Don't train them entirely for one session space the training out over multiple sessions. People learn better younger and older adults. Um, another kind of key point is to prefer when you've got interleave tasks that you're trying to train, where they're trying to monitor multiple, say, dials in a manufacturing environment. Variable priority training as opposed to fixed priority training is the best way to train. That is, tell them to allocate 40% of their time monitoring one particular feature, 60 on the other, and then switch that up to give them the opportunity to trade off monitoring, say, for different uh, situations in a factory setting. You want to try to minimize the extreme, what we call extraneous cognitive load by keeping critical information within working memory capacity. It's shrinking with age, and so it becomes really important to make sure critical information is always there if it's available, say, on the screen while people are learning new information. The other thing that has shown up very frequently in recent years is how testing can improve learning compared to self-study. Although we all hate being tested, and believe me, my students hate it, um, it's pretty clear that testing can improve learning because it gives you critical feedback on what you know and what you don't know. Finally, there are two general methods for putting together training packages. One is called topical, the other is called spiral. Topical, what you do is you train on a topic or a task to a basic competence level before going to the next topic. So say you have to learn A, B, and C. You train from easy to difficult aspects of A, easy to difficult aspects of B, easy to difficult aspects of C. Before you, So you train intensely to high skill level on each before you move to the next. In spiral, you train competence on a set of interrelated tasks. So you might train the basic tasks as A, then B, then C, and then spiral back to more difficult versions of A2, B2, C2, and spiral back again to A3, B3, C3 as you train. 
So now I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah, who will try to summarize some conclusions from what we've been discussing today. Thank you, Neil. Okay, so in conclusion, we know that we saw the trends that older adults are going to continue to be a presence in the workforce. Not just those 65 to 70, 74, but also those 75 and older. Older people want to remain productively engaged. A great majority enjoy working or need to work because of financial or benefits reasons. They are productive despite the myths. They are productive and can make strong contributions in terms of wisdom, experience, uh, working as part of a collaborative team. They are reliable and I can't underscore enough the fact that they are able to learn new skills and interact with new technologies. So as Neil said, they should be included in worker training and retraining programs. And in fact, Neil gave you a summary, but there are more detailed guidelines available for training and job design for older adults. And in fact, I hate to advertise, but CREATE has published a book on this topic uh, as part of the Human Factors and Aging series from CRC Press. Okay. Thank you, and now uh, if you have questions, uh, you can type them in and we'll try to address questions that you might have. Don't be bashful, you can all generate whatever questions you'd like. Hi, Neil. Hi, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, we have a question. How do the recommendations for training older adults translate to younger adults? Is there any reason why these recommendations would not be a good idea for younger adults? I'm thinking about possible uh, possible resistance from organizations developing two training programs, one for younger and one for older. There would be much less resistance if only one training uh, needed to be designed. I can take a shot and then Neil, you can follow up. Uh, I think the one uh, thing that's really important is the pace of training uh, because of age-related changes in processing speed and that it usually takes older adults longer to acquire new skills. Uh, so training at a pace to accommodate that may in fact be non-preferential for younger people who may get impatient uh, with a slower pace of training. Uh, and older adults may also uh, typically need more practice than, than younger people do. Uh, that's uh, part of the reason why we're looking into online and multimedia training programs because they do afford a way for people to uh, learn at their own pace. Neil? Yeah, let me pick up that question as well in terms of uh, some of the meta-analyses that tried to address exactly that issue. Is there a way in which a particular training method is better for older adults than for younger adults. And in general, the literature has not really shown a particular form of training as being particularly helpful for older adults, outside of what Sarah mentioned already, which is the pace of training. So no, in general, if you design a very good package that was initially aimed at younger adults, chances are it's going to be a very good package for older adults as long as the pacing is appropriate. And again, as Sarah underlined, with learning opportunities, most of the time, you'll present people with a link to a package, and they can kind of proceed at their own pace, in which case you've now put together a package that works equally well for younger and for older workers. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Um, one question is, have these, or how could these findings be used in an anti-ageism campaign? Well, um, I think, and in fact, I participated this past summer uh, in, a, in a workshop or a discussion uh, 
that was by the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, and it would really just start to to we to address this issue. Uh, and and the way it can be used is to as evidence to dispel some of the myths and stereotypes about older workers. Because as we saw, uh, the literature clearly does not support the notions that older people can't learn, they're unreliable, they're unproductive, or they change jobs a lot. What, in fact, the literature shows is the opposite of that. So I think there's a very solid evidence base um, towards that can be used to dispel these myths that unfortunately still exist today. Okay, so we have another question. How do you increase self-efficacy? Okay, I'll take a shot and then turn it to Neil. Uh, what we have found, uh, particularly when we're training older adults to use a particular technology, that the manner in which the they are introduced to the technology, and the way they are trained makes a huge difference. For example, in the study I learned, alluded to earlier, where we introdu introduced isolated seniors uh, and trained them to use a computer system, software system that we had designed. These were folks that had never seen a computer before. We not only <coughs> proved that they were able to learn to use the system and were using it and enjoying the use, but also we found that their proficiency increased dramatically and their self-efficacy towards using technology and computers also increased. And I think we can attribute it to the fact that the system was designed using a user-centered design approach, so it was easy to use. Um, it had things um, on the system features and functionalities that were useful to older people. They were involved in the design of the system. And we trained them gradually um, over time. And we also, at the beginning of training, and this was, I, I remember we had to revise our training script to address this. We had to reassure people that they were able to learn and that they could not break the computer. If they hit a wrong key, they were not going to break the computer. So we had to give them some hand-holding and reassurance at the very uh, outset. But what we found is with use, um, the more they used it, the greater their self-efficacy became. Neil? Yeah, let me pick up uh, Harvey's question again. And, and thank you, uh, the others who have also asked, uh, I guess, on uh, uh, some of these other questions. Um, one of the really critical things to ensure that they don't immediately run into a problem with failure is to know where they are before you start your training. And Creatus has generated some tools, and I'll, I'll give credit to Wally Boot, my colleague for this, things like the computer proficiency questionnaire, the mobile device proficiency questionnaire, all available on our website. I'll give another plug for www. Um, create-center.org, where you can pick up all these things for free, um, is by knowing what their current level of proficiency is with respect to the technology or the system that you're training them for. Because if you meet them where they're currently starting from, you're going to have much more success. So I'm just underlining in some sense what Sarah said already. Uh, but yes, try to understand what their current knowledge level is and we have some tools that can help when it comes to technology products, that can really ensure that they enjoy what they're doing initially because they're succeeding. Okay, so we have uh, just a couple of minutes left and two more questions, so perhaps we can answer these. Um, have you ever tried to show these results to smartphone companies, Apple or Samsung, in order for them to develop phones designed to older people? I do believe they want to attract this group too. Uh, I can briefly say that uh, we haven't worked with Apple uh, directly. Uh, one of the charges of CREATE is to um, not only produce results for the academic and research community, but also the nature of a lot of our work. Uh, the, our work is translational in nature, and one of our charges is to disseminate our findings to 
beyond the research community to business and industry. So we do collaborate and are always open to collaborating with uh, industrial groups. And we have, um, that's why our handbooks, uh, we have a handbook just general design guidelines for older adults are specifically written for uh, industry, business, developer, uh, communities as a means of getting this information out and into their hands. Yeah, and just to quickly follow up, Samsung makes the Jitterbug um, a particular phone aimed at older adults, so there is some movement in that direction. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of work going on right now, and we've done some in our labs as well on uh, phone use. Okay, and maybe time for one last quick question. Maybe uh, this seems uh, something that you might have some comments on, Neil. Um, any awareness of research on older adults who have been working in a field for a long time and now need to cope with the introduction of autonomous technologies? Yeah, we've done some surveys um, in, at, at Florida State dealing with older adults' attitudes towards autonomous vehicles. Uh, we oversampled the Florida older adult population. And not too surprisingly, older adults are more skeptical about, less likely to indicate interest in uh, pursuing. But part of that is due to lack of education about the particular um, technology in this case. And we, uh, this, I don't have time to get into a lot of details, but if you provided an information sheet that immediately pushed up what uh, people's attitudes were in terms of a favorable direction. So, I point out, particularly for autonomous vehicles, they're going to be critical in the future for enabling older adults to maintain uh, mobility uh, when they get to a point where vision um, may degrade so much that they can no longer safely drive that in cognition. So I think, again, drawing on theories of technology adoption, perceived usefulness is going to be a huge thing that will enable people uh, to maintain mobility in the case of autonomous vehicles, and uh, perceived ease of use is something we need to keep in mind when we're designing these types of systems. Okay, great. Well, I think that's all the time that we have uh, for today. Uh, we want to thank all of the, the people who attended today. This was a, um, great to have people's questions and participation. Thank you very much. Thanks again all for attending. And uh, we will be uh, editing this, so we've been recording this, uh, and we hope to release that um, fairly soon once we've done some editing and uh, some cleanup. Thank you. Thank you.